A shadow, not of the sun but of a simmering grudge, fell upon the joyous wedding feast. All the gods and goddesses of Olympus had gathered to celebrate the unlikely union of Peleus, a mortal king, and Thetis, a beautiful sea nymph. Laughter filled the air, the clinking of goblets echoing off the marble halls. Yet one crucial guest was absent Eris, the goddess of discord. Furious at this blatant exclusion, Eris plotted her revenge. In her workshop, crackling with malevolent energy, she forged a golden apple, a perfect sphere shimmering with an unnatural light. Upon it, she inscribed a single provocative word for the fairest. This seemingly innocent fruit held the potential for utter chaos. Slipping unseen into the midst of the revelry, Eris hurled the apple onto the banquet table. It landed with a heavy thud, the sound like a death knell amidst the jovial chatter. Conversation halted. All eyes fell upon the inscription, a spark of covetousness igniting in the hearts of three goddesses Hera, queen of the gods Athena, the wise warrior, and Aphrodite, the embodiment of love and beauty. Each goddess, convinced of her own unmatched beauty, laid claim to the apple. A tense silence descended upon the hall, thicker than the incense burning in golden censers. The gods and goddesses watched with a mixture of amusement and apprehension as the argument escalated. Hera, adorned in a shimmering peacock feather gown, declared that her position as queen entitled her to the apple. Athena, clad in gleaming armor, counted that her wisdom surpassed mere physical beauty. But it was Aphrodite, her form draped in flowing silks, who made the most enticing offer. In a voice like a siren's song, she promised Paris, a young Trojan prince who served as a cupbearer at the feast, the love of the most beautiful woman in the world. Blinded by this prospect, by the image of a love beyond compare, Paris dared to make the impossible choice. He awarded the apple to Aphrodite, a tremor of fear running through him as he realized the gravity of his decision. The air crackled with unspoken threats. Hera and Athena looked upon Paris with a mixture of fury and disgust. The seeds of discord, sown with such malice by Eris, had begun to sprout. News of the Trojan prince's judgment spread like wildfire. Helen, wife of Menelaus, the powerful king of Sparta, was widely regarded as the most beautiful woman alive. Whispers turned into accusations. Paris, they claimed, had chosen the fairest not just of the goddesses, but of all mortals. The flames of jealousy and rage licked at Menelaus' heart. He vowed to retrieve his wife, to exact vengeance upon Paris and the arrogant city of Troy. A great war council was convened in Mycenae, Menelaus' sprawling palace. Agamemnon, his brother and king of all Greece, rallied the heroes of the land. Odysseus, the cunning strategist, Achilles, the nigh invulnerable warrior, and countless others answered the call. The winds of war began to blow, carrying the promise of bloodshed and destruction. But Troy was no easy target. Its towering walls, built by the god Poseidon himself, seemed impregnable. The Greeks laid siege to the city, their hopes buoyed by the promise of glory and the return of Helen. Yet, years bled into decades. The initial fervor waned, replaced by frustration and discontent. Inside the Trojan walls, Helen became a symbol of both desire and discord. Priam, the aged king of Troy, watched helplessly as his city became a pawn in a game of gods and men. Hector, his bravest son, led the Trojan forces in a series of bloody battles, his prowess matched only by Achilles' unmatched skills. Then came the turning point, a tragedy that would forever scar the heroes of both sides. A bitter argument between Agamemnon and Achilles erupted, fracturing the fragile alliance among the Greeks. Achilles, enraged by the perceived insult, withdrew from the conflict, leaving the Greeks vulnerable. The tide turned in Troy's favor. Hector, emboldened by the absence of his greatest adversary, led a daring raid, driving the Greeks back to their ships. But fate, a cruel deity, had other plans. In the ensuing battle, Hector slew Patroclus, Achilles' closest friend. Grief, raw and consuming, ripped through Achilles, he cast aside his anger, donned his divinely crafted armor, and returned to the battlefield, a storm of vengeance incarnate. The duel between Hector and Achilles was legendary, a clash of titans that shook the very foundations of Troy. 
In the end, Hector fell, his death a mournful cry that echoed through the city. The Greeks, rejuvenated by Achilles' return, pressed their attack. Yet, victory remained elusive. Years of siege had begun to take their toll on both sides. It was then that Odysseus, ever the strategist, hatched a daring plan, a plan as audacious as it was shrouded in secrecy. Under the cloak of night, with the fires of their camp burning low, the Greeks began to dismantle their siege works. Ships were hastily loaded, men boarded with a grim efficiency born of years of war. Dawn broke, revealing a sight that sent a tremor of joy through the hearts of the weary Trojans. The Greek camp lay deserted, their fortifications abandoned. Cheers erupted within the city walls. The siege, it seemed, was finally over. The Trojans, blinded by euphoria, flung open the great gates, eager to reclaim their land. But amidst the jubilation, amidst the spilled wine and celebratory songs, a single voice, Cassandra, daughter of King Priam, spoke of foreboding. Blessed with the gift of prophecy, she had foreseen the Greeks' ploy. Yet, cursed by the jealous god Apollo, her pronouncements were met with disbelief and even ridicule. A colossal wooden horse, a supposed offering to the gods, stood outside the city gates. Its polished flanks glinted in the morning sun, its form both imposing and strangely beautiful. The Trojans, swayed by their newfound sense of victory and Cassandra's disregarded warnings, dragged the horse within the city walls. As dusk settled, casting long shadows across the jubilant city, a sense of unease began to creep in. The revelry died down, replaced by a quiet disquiet. Within the belly of the horse, hidden from view, a band of Greek warriors, led by the ever-resourceful Odysseus, waited with bated breath. The rhythmic creak-creak of the city gates opening, a sound both familiar and terrifying, reached their ears. Under the cover of a starless night, with the city shrouded in sleep and the after-effects of their celebration, the Greek warriors emerged from the horse's belly. A silent signal, a pre-arranged glint of moonlight off a blade, and the remaining Greek forces, who had hidden behind a nearby island, surged towards Troy. The city gates, left unguarded in their euphoria, provided easy access. A scream, sharp and piercing, shattered the night's stillness. It was the herald of a nightmare unleashed. The Greeks, fueled by years of pent-up frustration and the promise of vengeance, swept through the sleeping city like a whirlwind of fury. Swords clashed, flames erupted as buildings were set ablaze, the air thick with the stench of blood and burning wood. Menelaus, his eyes burning with a righteous anger, finally confronted Paris. Their duel, a personal battle amidst the wider carnage, mirrored the conflict that had ignited the war. But this time, victory belonged to the wronged husband. Paris fell, his life a final payment for his reckless choice. The once proud city of Troy became a battleground, its streets awash in blood, its homes echoing with the screams of the dying. The Trojans, roused from their drunken slumber, fought with a desperate ferocity, but they were outnumbered and outmaneuvered. Even Hector's mighty brother, Dephobus, fell to Achilles' relentless rage. As the sun rose, painting the sky with a ghastly orange glow, the battle reached its climax. King Priam, his face etched with grief and despair, pleaded with Achilles for the life of his remaining son, Polydorus. But the warrior, fueled by the loss of Patroclus, was consumed by an insatiable thirst for vengeance. Polydorus, a mere boy caught in the maelstrom of war, met his untimely end. The fall of Troy was swift and brutal. By midday, the city center lay in ruins, the once proud citadel reduced to smoldering rubble. The air hung heavy with smoke and the acrid scent of death. Helen, retrieved by Menelaus, stood amidst the carnage, a silent witness to the devastation wrought in her name. But victory, it seemed, came at a terrible cost. The once unified Greek army, fractured by years of hardship and internal conflict, began to crumble. The gods, ever fickle in their loyalties, had intervened, favoring one side or the other at their whim. The journey home, Odysseus would later recount, was filled with trials and tribulations, a testament to the gods' displeasure. The Trojan War, a conflict ignited by a spiteful goddess and fueled by the pride and greed of men, left a legacy of bloodshed and despair. 
It was a wound that would scar the heroes who fought and the civilizations involved for generations to come.